This is session 16 for models in epidemiology and biostatistics. My name is Gordon Hilton Fick. And on the session today, we're going to be looking at matching. And we're going to be looking at classical analyses with match studies and also model-based analyses from match studies. You have probably seen the analysis of match studies when the outcome is measured. And one then sees the so-called paired t-test. So what we're going to be looking at in today's session is when the outcome is dichotomous. So, let's establish an, an example to get us started. We're going to look at a cohort study in which matching was used. This was a study of cancer patients and the outcome was their five-year survival rate. This was survival yes, survival no. And there were two treatments, or if you like, exposures. Participants received either chemotherapy for their cancer or surgery for their cancer. Now, the part of this study that is different from things we've seen before is that the patients were grouped into pairs based on characteristics thought to be possible confounding characteristics. In this instance, age, gender, and clinical condition. So all of the participants in this study were grouped into pairs. Then we can begin by noting that within each pair, one patient will receive the chemotherapy and one will receive the surgery. Now, you can see then that this is where the randomization comes in. We're randomly assigning within a pair. So it is not complete randomization. And so it is, in fact, the matching which builds into our study a lack of independence between measurements. And this is an issue that will come up as we proceed through the establishment of the study and how, how such a study needs to be analyzed. Okay. Now we will also be presuming that this five-year survival is known for each individual, and there's no censoring and no loss to follow-up. Okay, we will just know whether or not a patient has died, and that the, that is known for each individual. Okay. It's also worth noting here that then for each pair, we're going to know whether it was the chemotherapy patient who lived or died and whether or not it was the surgery patient who lived or died. But notice here that if we were to compare the outcome within pairs, that the age, gender, and clinical condition were the same for both individuals. Hmm. Now, it is also of interest to notice that if, in fact, both of the patients in a given pair had lived, we know nothing about the difference in survival rates for these two patients that have the same age, gender, and condition. And similarly, we see that for a pair for which both patients died, that we gain no information as to the association between the uh, outcome here, survival, and the exposure, which was the treatment assignment. The pairs of this type are called the concordant pairs. 
and you may, may be able to gain some appreciation for the fact that concordant pairs do not contribute to the analysis if we refer to the uh, pair t test notice that if the value of the measured outcome for two individuals in a matched pair were both identical then the difference between those two measurements would be zero and hence that difference of zero contributes nothing to the average difference across all the pairs. Hmm. Now it's also worth noting that if for a given pair one patient lived and the other died, then we have what's called a discordant pair. And there's two types, right? It could be that the chemotherapy patient lives and the surgery patient dies or it could be that the surgery patient lives and the chemotherapy patient dies. Notice that then we are getting information for a given pair of individuals of the same age, gender, and condition. It is the discordant pairs that contribute to the assessment of the relationship between survival rate and exposure. The discordant pairs now let's think about that for a second. If, for example, for a discordant pair where the surgery patient died but the chemotherapy patient lived, we could say it looks like chemotherapy is an advantage over surgery in, in, as far as survival rate goes. We're seeing if a higher proportion of the discordant pairs are where the surgery patient died but the chemotherapy patient lived, we might be seeing, aha, we have a better survival rate for those receiving chemotherapy compared with those receiving surgery. It's also worth noting here that for every discordant pair, the comparison is based entirely on two patients of the same age, gender, and condition. So, it's, it's helpful to then, then see that, in a real way, we have adjusted, using language from earlier in these sessions, we have adjusted for age, gender, and condition by matching. So the uh, design has handled the potential confounders rather than the analysis method. So inevitably, then, we can count up the number of pairs where the this the surgery patient lived and the chemotherapy patient died and compare that with the number of pairs for which the surgery patient died and the chemotherapy patient lived okay that's sounding pretty pretty helpful pretty useful now it is worth noting here and this this will pop up a lot in, in our investigation of studies like this. That statistical independence of measurements is lost, generally, when we match. Inevitably, then, we can see that the two measurements from a given discordant pair are correlated, right? Since we matched on age, gender, and, and condition. For example, if, for example, the clinical condition was a mild one and the, uh, the people were young, say, then we, might, we would be able to see, aha, those two outcomes for that particular type of pair are obviously correlated compared with, say, individuals, say, who are uh, both much more, more seriously ill and perhaps older. Okay. So there is a correlation between the measurements, and it is, it is built in. And you may remember that all of the, in all of the sessions we've explored previously, the statistical independence of measurements was assumed. Aha! So let's take a look at an example. In our example, there, it turns out that there are 
1,242 patients, but they are grouped into pairs. There are 621 pairs of patients. And the 621 pairs have, within pair, the same age, gender, and clinical condition. There is correlation in the measurements now. They are not statistically independent. Nevertheless, you might be thinking, OK, well, what if I just computed the 2 by 2 table and in the way in which we did very early on in these sessions? Well, then you might say, OK, well, for those receiving chemotherapy, you can see we get 106 out of 621. For those receiving surgery, we get 95 out of 621. Hmm. Those two uh, rates or estimates of survival are nearly the same. Mm hmm. Further, we could, if we were being very attentive, note that Fisher's exact test could, could have been used here, and we get a very high p-value. An odds ratio estimate that is close to one and a confidence interval that includes the null. So we get, we think we have gotten, that the odds of survival for those receiving chemotherapy is estimated to be 1.14 times the odds of survival for those receiving surgery. Oh, yeah, well, looks like we have been unsuccessful in, in detecting a relationship between survival rate and treatment. Okay, but remember the data here that's included in this 2 by 2 table is not based on statistically independent measurements. And there's matching. The exact matched analysis here, or the correct matched analysis here, identifies the matching. In this case, we have the survival for the patient in each match set that received surgery and the survival for each the patient in each match set that received chemotherapy. What do we see here in this study that is that is very revealing here? Of the 621 match sets, 510 match sets had both patients die. They did not survive for five years. That's a lot of the participants that are, that are a lost to the analysis here. They contribute nothing as far as the relationship between survival and exposure. Same thing we see that actually there's 90 match sets in which they both lived. Okay, well, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that perhaps for these 510 uh, matched, matched pairs, they had a, 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 too, a far too advanced clinical condition, or they were elderly, and so they both died. Up here, these 90 individuals, well, what are we seeing here now? We're seeing that they might have had a much milder clinical condition, or maybe they were younger. We're, it's not entirely clear, but what we're seeing is that the study design here appears to be quite flawed insofar as the participants selected for this particular study, a majority were either far too... Uh, seriously ill, perhaps, or possibly far too, too too old, for the ability to see the advantage of one of the treatments over the other. And similarly, there's a huge proportion of match of the match pairs in which they both live. Again, it could be that the real issue in play here is the study design that we. We did not uh, select patients for which it is 
at least plausible to explore the fact that survival might depend on treatment. Because what do we see here? Only 21 of the match sets are discordant. Only 21 of them actually contribute to the assessment of the relationship between survival and, and treatment. So in a real way, we're then seeing that the number, if you like, the sample size in this instance, or the number of independent trials, is just 21. And it can be shown, but we'll, we'll skip through this a bit, but that the odds ratio estimate is given by the ratio of 16 to 5 here, or 3.2. It might also be fairly clear here that the p-value is going to come from the binomial distribution. There are 21 trials. n is 21, if you like to use the, the letter n. The real sample size is only 21, the number of discordant pairs. And we are then modeling the number of individuals of either this particular type of discordancy or this particular type of discordancy. You can do it either way, as we'll see in a second. So the p-value can be computed from the binomial, not, the, not Fisher's exact, and the odds ratio comes from the number of discordant pairs of a particular type. Oh yeah. Now in fact we can compute this p-value and the corresponding confidence interval for the odds ratio using something that might be not entirely obvious. But the p-value here, we can see, can be viewed as the number 16 being the number, uh, in this particular instance, going back to the table again, we have that 16 of the 21, the chemotherapy patient, survived, but the surgery patient did not. Notice that particular type of discordancy. You can see, okay, huh, that's a fairly big difference from this type of discordancy, the five uh, patients that, that died with chemotherapy but lived with surgery. So there's an imbalance here. It's not, they're not close to one another, right? In fact, we can then ask, what is the null hypothesis in this instance? Well, in general language, it, it is that the uh, survival rate does not depend on the treatment. But, in, but when it's formulated in terms of the discordant pairs, we see that the probability of, discordant, of the discordant pair being where the surgery patient lives is the same as the, the probability of the discordant pair being with the chemotherapy patient surviving. In other words, the null hypothesis of the probability of a particular discordant pair being of the type, in this, just to spin it this way, where it is the, uh, the, sorry, the uh, chemotherapy patient living, is, is 16, is, is then our null hypothesis. We can see the probability that it is the surgery patient lives in those discordant pairs is one half. If, in fact, there's no difference between the uh, probability uh, between survival and the treatment assignment. So P is the probability that the discordant pair has, has the chemotherapy patient surviving and the surgery patient dying. And you could, you could do this the other way, right? You could spin it in terms of the probability that it is the surgery patient that survives and the chemotherapy patient dies. And so we would be looking at instead of 16 or more, we'd be looking at five or less. Both work, because we're going to be doubling that p-value, right? That's, that's the way in which it works in this instance. So the probability we get is either getting uh, a discordant pair with 
16 or more or 5 or less, which is the same as doubling the probability of 16 or more. And we get a p-value of under 5%, actually under 3%. Well, it's a little bit of a spin, but we're going to leave it for, it's a little bit of a technical matter, but we can in fact compute a confidence interval for the probability that the discordant pair has the surgery, has the chemotherapy patient surviving. And what do we get? Well, we get a confidence interval that does not include one half. Right? It's higher than one half. That makes sense. The p-value is under 5%, so the 95% confidence interval does not include the null, which is one half. Right. We can then compute from the confidence interval and the estimate from this particular uh, confidence interval immediate command, we can compute the estimates of the odds ratios. We can compute the the estimate of the odds ratio and the and the lower and upper limit to that confidence interval directly from this. We get the estimate of the odds ratio, 3.2 now, and a confidence interval for it that does not include the null. Hmm, it's quite wide though. That makes a lot of sense because, well, there's only 21 discordant pairs. However, we do get a p-value that is less than 5% here, and a confidence interval that does not include the null. Notice that is very differently different from the result we, we got from the incorrect analysis that assumed independence, that did not incorporate the matching into the analysis. A pretty big deal, really. Okay. So, let's proceed now with how um, we could have seen such an analysis handled uh, from a data management perspective here. It turns out that the data can be available to you, either you by you designing it that way or by the data that you inherited, in what's what is referred to in two different formats. We can have the data in so-called long format, or we can have the data in so-called wide format, and we'll see what that means. We want to be able, though, to have a convenient way to convert the data from one shape to the other. The reshaping issue turns out to be something we do not want to, to have as an obstacle in, in how we carry out the analysis of this particular data. Long format here is essentially the same as the format we, we have seen in the data for, for other, proje other projects we've analyzed in these sessions. That is where each row in the data set is for each individual. Then we will see that it is actually possible to have the data set recorded where each row is the data for each match set. So it turns out that a long data set requires a, var available, a variable to determine the pair, whereas the wide data sets require an, uh, the, the exposure for each individual in the pair. Okay, so a little bit technical. So here's what a long data set would look like, very familiar to us. We have an explanatory variable. We have then, uh, that is the pair, and we have another explanatory variable, that is the treatment assignment, and then we have the outcome, survival. So here, chemo here is the indicator for chemotherapy assignment, and pair is the is the label for the particular pair in our study. Let's look at the first pair in this study, listed with two rows. You can see that by design here, by matching, each pair contains one individual 
that had surgery and one that had chemo. So the surgery patient is coded 0 and the chemotherapy patient is coded 1. All right. And that's going to be the case for each pair in this study. We're going to have exactly one in each. That was by the matching characteristics. In pair number one, although it's not listed here, we have the matching based on their age, their gender, and their clinical condition. And what do we see? In this first matched pair, both patients died. They had five-year survival that was indicated as a zero, meaning they died. This is a, an example, then, of a concordant pair or a concordant match set. The second pair, again, we have one, the one individual that received surgery and the one that received chemo. And in this example, it was the chemotherapy patient that survived and the uh, so, sorry, it was the it was this it was the surgery patient that survived, and the chemotherapy patient did not survive. Okay, notice that's an example of a discordant pair. Here we have uh, an example of a concordant pair, and here is an example of a discordant pair. Now you might think that in this data set we would also have a rook a rook a record of what their age, gender, and clinical condition was. And that might well be something you would have available to you so that you could, in principle, then check that the matching was done properly. Long format. There, in this instance, there would be 1,242 rows, right? Two rows for each of the 621 match pairs. All right, now let's look at the wide, for, the wide format for our data. Now what, we, what have we got? We've got, for each row, we have one matched pair. Then what we have recorded in the next two columns is the survival status for the patient that received surgery. That is part of the variable name here, right? And the survival status for the person that received chemotherapy. Part of the now instead of having SURV, we have SURV0, which is the variable uh, recording for each match pair, the survival status of the person receiving surgery, and here is the survival status for the person receiving chemotherapy. Notice that the information is exactly the same as what we saw in the uh, long format. We've recorded that both patients died in pair number one, and it is a concordant pair. Further, in the second match pair, we have that the surgery patient lived and the chemotherapy patient died. Okay, so notice we can, from from the Y data set, we can record, we, 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 can, we record exactly the same information that we had in the Y data set, in the long data set, and vice versa. Okay. We will see that there are examples in which the, the Y data set is indeed considerably wider than the long data set. What we can see, though, is that in this, in this small example we have here, that the wide data set has only 621 rows, whereas the long data set had, had 1,242 rows. All right. So what you have in most of the time is that the choice of long and and wide will be dependent on what form of analysis you want to do. It may be that you recorded the data initially in long format, but then it will be convenient or advantageous to switch the data to wide format and vice versa. There are a variety of circumstances. 
And some of the issues we're going to be looking at here is, is our, essentially our first example of a study in which there is lack of independence that comes from uh, studies in which we'll see in which the issue is so-called longitudinal or where there's clustering or where there's things are being repeated. And again, that's just anticipating a session that's still to come yeah, later on in, in all of these sessions. So in a, in a way, we're looking at a, a comparatively simple example of a situation in which we have uh, a lack of independence that comes from matching. We will see that this lack of independence is an issue with longitudinal studies, with studies where there's clustering, and in studies where there's repeated measures. Okay. Okay. What is very handy in Stata as a data management system is that we can convert our data from long to wide or convert the data from wide to long. And we will see that we want to do so in a way in which there's no information lost. Or we have arranged for the data in, uh, in such a way that the things we need for any anticipated analysis uh, will not depend on whether it's in long format or wide format. The command is called reshape in data. And for example, if we have the data in what we saw above was long format, then reshaping it to wide is this command, where we record the variables that do change within pair. Okay. In this instance, it is the outcome, survival. And so we will have then the indicator for the, uh, the pair, which is one of those numbers in our example from 1 to 621. And we will then have the indicator within pair that records uh, whether or not it is the, the person receiving chemo or the person receiving surgery. Okay, so the letter I here is for the identification of the pair, and the J here is recording the variable that is going to be changed. In other words, we're going to be keeping track of not just survival, but survival with two new variables when we go to wide format. Right? We're going to have the survival for those receiving surgery and the survival for those receiving, receiving chemo. We saw that in the example. The wide format replaces the variable SURV with two variables, SURV0 and SURV1. And that is the process that we need and the reshaping. Okay. So we, we saw earlier that the incorrect command, the incorrect analysis, would explore uh, the 2-by-2 the, uh, two two table that does not identify the matching. We saw that we got an estimate of the odds ratio that was near 1 and a confidence interval that included the null and a p-value that was well over 5%, over 40%. Well, it turns out that this incorrect analysis could have been done directly with the data in long format. But to carry out our classical, what we refer to as the classical or non-model-based analysis, in Stata, we need the data in wide format. And we'll see that in a second. So what do we need to do? Well, there's the command as I as I showed you earlier. Then we get the the output from Stata, which which points out that the variable chemo is now dropped, but its value then becomes part 
of the variable name in the wide format. So chemo was 0 or 1, 0 for those receiving surgery and 1 for those receiving chemo. And so the variable SURV is replaced by the two variables, SURV0 and SURV1. Right. Notice that the data going from long format to wide is taking us from a, ver from, uh, a data set with 1,242 rows and replacing it with a data set with 621 rows. Here the number of variables is the same, but as we'll see later, that uh, in, in more elaborate circumstances, we are replacing a long variable, a, a long data set, with a smaller number of variables than we would, would see in the wide format. Okay, that's basically the, the process. This sort of process is the kind of thing that I would recommend you put into a script that, sh that enables you to carry out this reshaping. It is also, as, as uh, I will note here, if you reshape the data from long to wide, then you can you can go back by using reshape long and take the data back to the original long format. And the key here is that the reshaping does not change the information. Either the data in long format or wide format contain exactly the same information. Now that we have the data in wide format, we can use instead of the command that's called MCC. This is for matched case control. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, we had a matched cohort study here. Right, so we'll come back to this in a minute. But for the moment, let's just quickly explore. Okay, we've got the correct 2x2 two two table with the 21 discordant pairs. Mm-hmm, right. And we get the p-value that I showed you before based on the binomial distribution. There it is, and I I put this in red here. Now, Stata also gives us um, what it calls McNamara's chi-squared. In this instance, it turns out that this chi-square comes from, well, the normal approximation to the binomial. So McNamara's chi-square is the approximate uh, p-value, and the exact p-value comes from the binomial distribution. State as output, it, it says exact McNamara significance probability. Uh, maybe I wouldn't choose that as the way how I would name this, but no matter. We're fine. Notice this is the p-value that came from the binomial distribution. And further, we can get the exact confidence interval from the uh, binomial confidence interval that we did earlier. And Stata does that for us. And so we get the correct analysis here. Okay, now you might be thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't look quite right. Here we have exposure, uh, exposed yes, exposed no, but in fact, this is survival, yes, survival, no, survival, yes, survival, no. And then we have here, instead of case control, we have, in fact, the, the exposure or the treatment, okay? So that's what, what's set up here. You have to kind of uh, take the generic output you get from, from Stata sometimes and convert it into what makes sense for you in the particular situation you're working with. This is a good example of that. Because in this particular instance, we see the output from MCC is supposing the data was from a case control study, but we're carrying out this analysis of a matched cohort study. And so you can see that exposure here is survival status and case control status is the uh, exposure status. So they're reversed. You just have to be clear that and make it and maybe what you need to do when you're preparing, say, your slide for a presentation or for for a manuscript, 
that you take out the generic things the software's given you and correctly input the the information you need. You maybe have to do some use of a de of a of a text editor to do that, right? Not not out of the question. Not not impossible, right? But more importantly, it is understanding how to interpret output from software that can be very generic at times and perhaps counterintuitive, but it's giving us what we want. And that's the more important thing. Okay. And here, very briefly, this is perhaps going back to maybe what might have been in your first course in statistics or your first course in probability. When, when the discussion of the normal approximation of the binomial might have been given. I'm not going to go over this except to point out that, that the normal approximation of the binomial gives us uh, a, a z and then the z can be used to compute uh, a probability. Except we can see here that that's exactly the same as instead of taking the probability that z is greater in absolute value than 2.4, well, that's the same as the, the square of the normal, that's the chi-squared 1 here, uh, being greater than 5.76. So what we see here is that the normal approximation to the binomial gives us the so-called chi-square, or McNamara chi-square here. And Frankly, in in twenty in, in in the current in the current year, I maybe I won't mention what year it is. Uh, hopefully, these videos will be around for a while. But in in current times, one could say that well, maybe we don't need the normal approximation of the binomial anymore. It was something that uh, certainly was taught in courses. Maybe there's a there's merit to seeing it. But if you can use the exact p-value here, shouldn't you be doing so? And here's a very good example of that. Now, I am spending a bit of time showing you then the, 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 the approximate uh, McNamara chi-square here, because almost certainly in, in your own literature review, where, where such methods are being used, you may see the McNamara chi-square. Now, if the exact uh, p-value based on the binomial distribution is not given, you may be you may be at, you may need to ask: Is that an issue? Is the is the is there uh, merit in using the available data in the output, presumably in the paper, to compute the actual correct? exact p-value. And uh, this can be an issue at times. And, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concerning issue sometimes. Does the approximate method uh, give us something close to the correct exact method, or is it misleading us? And this can be an issue. Okay. Exact compared with approximate. Right. All right. Okay, so we've now gone through an example of a matched case control study in which there was, uh, we matched on age, gender, and clinical condition, and we then had uh, one uh, person receiving uh, uh, chemotherapy and one receiving uh, the surgery. Now let's look at a study also for which matching was involved. And what we're going to be doing now is, is matching based on clinical conditions again, or other issues thought to be potential confounders. And what are we going to have in this instance? Well, it turns out that there was uh, to the investigator, a lot more controls than there was cases available to them in this particular project. So that, in fact, they were able to carry out 
a matching where they had four match controls for each of the cases. So the controls in this instance will be those without cancer, and the cases were the ones with, in this particular illustration, endometrial cancer. Okay, so we now know that there, each match set will have five women, right? We have five participants, four of them without cancer, and one with cancer. And then we can ask, is there a rel relationship between uh, case control status and an exposure. In this instance, for, for this particular illustration here, for this particular session, we will suppose that the exposure of, it, of interest is the use of estrogens. There might be other characteristics that might be worth exploring, but for, for us here, we'll suppose that the exposure is exposure to estrogen use. This is, this is not an, a, a, a new study. Okay. So we have exposure status, which is something we look back in time for, for each of the participants. And, and that looks like a standard case control. However, the difference is the matching that was done at the beginning. Okay. The matching based on the uh, characteristics thought to be potential confounders. And we'll explore more of this as we move forward. Okay, but now we have four controls with, for each of the cases. And a match set now contains five participants, not two. It's no, we don't say match pair anymore. Uh, you could say, well, it's a match quintuple or a match set. Quint. Quintet? No. In any case, we have, like we saw before, if we had the data in a long format to begin with, we could construct a 2 by 2 table ignoring the matching. In this particular instance, we get this analysis. We get a low p-value, less than 1%, and quite a large uh, odds ratio estimate. Right, confidence interval that does not include the null. And in fact, the lower limit is 3.3. Uh, Nevertheless, this analysis assumes there was no matching. There was statistical independence. Mm -mm. So this analysis is, is now uh, questioned. It is not the analysis that should be reported. Let's move forward. Let's have a look at what the, the analysis would look like if, in fact, we were to correctly identify the matching. So we need to first establish uh, the, the, the reshaping of the data from long format to wide format. And this it can be, as I said earlier, a bit of a handful to getting the data configured in such a way. So in the first instance, we're going to then sort the data uh, first by, by uh, which matched set a person is in and then their case control status. So what we'll see then is that the, the first four in that match set then will, will be uh, the controls and the fifth will be, because it's sorted so that the fifth is uh, the last one listed in each match set. Then we'll construct a variable, which is, well, o, OTF is for one to five in which we then create an indicator for the measurement in each of the match sets. So this is something we, we might not have had to do uh, if, if the analysis wasn't a matched analysis, right? And just for illustration here, we're going to keep track of, of the case control status, of course, in each match set. 
it depends on uh, it, it varies within match set and we'll also record a number of other interest uh, uh, potential variables of interest then we'll record as we did before the indicator for which which match set is uh, is to be identified and then this variable OTF or 1 to 5 which records which of the five uh, individuals are in each match set with the fifth being the the case here's an example then in which we have uh, in going from long to wide we go from 315 which was 63 times 5 to 63 we're going from long which is an, a row for each individual to wide where it's a row for each match set and this is another example in which <clears throat> we are going from long where the number of variables is going to be much longer much more much much more in wide format so the data set is much wider than the long format but it is uh, not as long so we can see that we're going to be keeping track of the uh, case control status being replaced by CC1, CC2 to CC5. Well, we know what they are. CC1 is 0, and CC2 is 0, CC3 is 0, CC4 is 0, CC5 is 1. That's what we did up here when we planned that out. Now, the exposure that we're going to be looking at is estrogen use here. Okay? So what we can see here is that EST1 is the exposure for the first control at EST2 is the exposure for the second control and so on EST5 is the exposure for the case so the first four are the controls and the fifth is the case okay so then this variable we created OTF is excluded because it's now a part of the variable names okay you can see why we get a lot more variables when we had when we bring in all of these issues all of these characteristics that may be of interest to us as we proceed with analysis okay so that's how it works and i will uh be humble uh, can be humbled and report to you that sometimes getting this right <laughs> getting the the format for establishing the switching from long to wide or from wide to long uh, may may take some some uh, uh, some work and some some repetition and some attention it happens okay so that's that's just the nature of of how things go okay uh, However, again, once you've got the correct format and the correct okay, command syntax set up for your reshaping, it's the, it's the kind of thing you want to keep. You want to save it in the script that you have that does all of your data management, perhaps some data cleaning and other things. Okay. Okay, let's now look at the, the crucial steps. So this is data management stuff. We've got our, the crucial issue is this variable right here. This is the exposure to estrogen. Because the first thing we're going to do is construct a table that will be analogous to the correct 2 by 2 table we had with uh, the, the matched pair analysis. Now we're going to be keeping track of this variable sum con. That is going to give us what so if if S1 is a 1, that means that, that the first control was exposed. By adding up these four, we're getting the number of controls in each match set that were exposed. Further, some casts 
here is giving us whether or not the case was exposed. So we can, we can see then the crucial issue is how many of the controls were exposed to estrogen and whether or not the case was exposed to estrogen. Okay, that gives us now a 5 by 2 table. Let's explore this new table in some detail. It's just a 2 by 5 table, folks, but it's filled with important information. It sure is. Let's look at this particular table. I get that using the table command and stata. So the row characteristic and the column characteristic. Let's look at this number three here. What is that? Okay, that tells us that, well, of the 63 match sets, three of them, the case was exposed and none of the controls were. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. That's, that would be, if, if, if I may, supportive of uh, circumstances in which we're seeing that case is influencing uh, that uh, case is is influencing exposure okay that there is a relationship between exposure and case control status okay now let's look at these four up here this four okay four of the 63 match sets the case was not exposed, but the one of the controls was. Now I'm highlighting those seven, the three and the four here in red, because now this is where we're starting to get dr drilling this down. There's exactly one individual in these seven match sets that was exposed. In three of those, it was the case. And in four of them, it was one of the four controls. Uh-huh. So we can see that by focusing our attention on these seven match sets, we are noting that exactly one in that match set was exposed. Which one is then the issue? Let's look at the 17 here. That's a fair number. 17 is, there were 17 match sets where the case was exposed and one of the four controls was exposed. Ooh. That's giving us in a, a very clear indication, isn't it, that Case control status is influencing exposure status because there's only one of the other type. Notice here that in this uh, table, this one is saying that the uh, case was not exposed and two of the four controls were. Hmm. Now let's focus our attention on these seven, these 18 match sets. That is, there were 18 match sets where exactly two were exposed. And what we see is that in 17 of them, the case was exposed. And in only one, the case was not exposed. Now that's giving us clear, a clear indication of the relationship between case control status and exposure status, isn't it? And we get the same thing with these two groups of match sets. 16 of the match sets, the case was exposed and two of the four uh, controls were, but 
only one where the case was not exposed and three of the four were exposed among the controls. So now when we restrict attention to the match sets where exactly three were exposed, we see that in 16 of the 17, the case was one of them, was one of the, the ones that was exposed. We are now, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the phrase now again, we are, or, or I'll use the phrase, we are conditioning on the number exposed. Aha! Now let's look at, let's look back at that first set of seven where exactly one was exposed. Well, what's the probability then, if exactly one is exposed, what is the probability that the case is exposed? Well, the case, if case and control status is nothing to do with exposure status, then, well, the case is just one of the five. And so the probability that the case is exposed is one-fifth. That's the null hypothesis here. Ooh, yeah. The null hypothesis. That is... If we restrict our attention to those match sets where exactly one was exposed, we can ask what's the probability that the case was. And if the null hypothesis is true, and in the, and in, in the real world then, we're, we're thinking about <clears throat> the, uh, the fact that there's no, in the null, null world, there's no relationship between case control status and exposure status then the probability the case is exposed when it is one of just the five that were, that were exposed, the probability the case is exposed is just one-fifth. Aha! Okay, let's now look at the match sets where exactly two were exposed. Okay. Then we can ask again. What's the probability that any one of them is exposed? Any one of the five is exposed. Well, that's two over five, because there's two exposed in the, in the, in, of the five. So that then is the prob is then under the null hypothesis, the probability that the case is, the, is, is one of the two that's exposed is, is two-fifths, right? Because there's two that are exposed and there are three that weren't. Okay. Similarly, we can repeat this, and you may find going through the logic here helpful. We get three-fifths and four-fifths. Right. So the fact that we got 15 here, where the case was exposed and three of the controls were exposed, is not, I think you could say, not particularly helpful here because the probability that that the case is exposed is four-fifths now and you can see that now we're looking at a, a an imbalance again but the null hypothesis probability is getting higher right so we have four p-value uh, four a null hypothesis probabilities and four binomial calculations that can be done oh yeah this isn't this isn't so bad, All right? So let's now look at the results. Let's first carry out the calculation using the exact binomial, and the three out of seven, where we were restricting attention or conditioning on exactly one of the of the persons uh, was exposed in those match sets. So the null hypothesis probability is one-fifth or 0.2. And the, and the p-value then you can see there, restricting attention to just those seven uh, match sets is uh, maybe not too surprisingly, but it's, it's nearly 50%. Oh, but let's now get to where the evidence is overwhelming. 
If we restrict our attention now to the circumstance in where exactly two were exposed, we see that 17 of the 18, one of the two was the case. And that gives us a binomial probability that can be computed where the null hypothesis probability is 2, 2 over 5 or 0.4. Well, that's a tiny probability, not too surprisingly. You can see it recorded here. All right. Probability of 17 or 18 here is is way below. Uh, well, here you can see, oh, by the way, here is the actual probability computed with scientific notation, just to show you how small it really is here. So roughly 2 times 10 to the minus 6. Oh, yeah. So those 18 match sets where exactly two were exposed is giving us essentially the evidence that there is a relationship between case control status and, and uh, exposure status. Oh, yeah. We can do the, that for uh, the match sets where there were three, exactly three out of five exposed and exactly four out of five exposed. Again, we get a very, very crucial evidence from the match sets where three of the five are exposed. And maybe not too surprisingly, not much of a, not much evidence where four of the five are exposed. Uh, so getting 15 out of 16, although it's, there's imbalance, the null hypothesis probability here is, is actually uh, four-fifths or 0.8. And so that particular set of match sets is is not contributing to the evidence. Okay, so we we then could say, okay, that we have components to the p-value from each of the four different such circumstances, all of them involving the discordant pairs. Let me just, if I didn't mention it, let me mention it one more time here. There are five concordant pairs of five uh, uh, concordant match sets here of five, right? So this is a f in five of the match sets, the case was exposed and all four of the controls were. That's concordant and does not contribute to the assessment of the relationship between case control status and exposure status. And somewhat interestingly here, this blank means there was no one, there were no match sets where the case was not exposed and all four of the controls were not exposed. So the number of concordant sets here is only five out of the 63. We're getting uh, evidence contributing from the other uh, mat match sets here. The, I guess, what would it be, 50? 58 of the match sets. Okay. Now, um, there are ways to take these exact p-values computed from the binomial and uh, con constructing a p-value that is uh, all-encompassing from the, from, the, from the different uh, mat match set types. This takes us into the world of, of uh, it turns out to be the same world as in the world of meta-analyses. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time with this here, except to point out that one can use an approach that comes from the meta-analysis of p-values and an unweighted combining of the p-values. And I, again, this is only one way in which this could have been done, but gives us then, not, surpri not too surprisingly, a, uh, a p-value uh, combining the, the four analyses here. And this is of, you know, it's attributed to Fisher again. 
And uh, maybe not too surprisingly, the, the dominant group of, of match sets was those with exactly two exposed. And, but we get additional evidence from the uh, group of match sets where three were exposed. Nevertheless, we see we get a, a very low p-value, right? Now, I don't want to spend too much time with the more technical side of this, um, except to, to show you that what it would look like if, for example, we had a study where there were six controls for each match set. Uh, six controls in each match set. So six controls and one exp and one case in each match set. So there's seven in each match set. Six of them are the controls and one of them is the is the case. Then we can record just like we did in the in the earlier example. Now would it what would be a two by seven table rather than a two by five table. And we could proceed in exactly the same way with the uh, match sets of the type where exactly one was exposed, where exactly two were exposed, and so on. So the, the method of analysis here is, it's more detailed, but it's getting at the crucial issues in play here. And here is a little more of the, the, the data that one would get for, for the circumstance in which we have uh, M match, matched controls uh, for, for each case. So, for example, if M is 1, that means there's one control for each case, and the null hypothesis probability is 1 half. In our case where M was 4, we had the, the four probabilities associated with each of the different groups of match set based on the number exposed. And you can see then if we had six, a six to one ratio, we get these null hypothesis probabilities and these odds. And here's what the formula looks like for what is then called the conditional likelihood function in this analysis. And there's a single explanatory, a single uh, regression coefficient of interest here, and that is uh, the log odds ratio. Okay. And so we get a, a function that can be used to for analysis. We can maximize this function and explore its curvature, like we've seen earlier in these sessions. And I'll show you a graph. Uh, uh, somewhat later. Okay. And here's what we got for the 4 to 1. Uh, this is what the formula would look like. And then we would have, for example, with the actual data from our endometrial cancer study, we would get a log likelihood function that looks like this. Again, looks a bit intimidating, a bit impenetrable, but it's, it's again, the sort of thing that we don't have to address here as a user of biostatistical methods because state is doing the heavy lifting for us, as we will see. Okay. And there's the equation, and there's, there's what it looks like. So again, it turns out that the conditional likelihood function has the same properties as the likelihood function we've seen earlier with logistic regression. In other words, the properties of the MLE, the standard error for the MLE, and so on. The mechanisms, the likelihood ratio test, for example, all available. Okay. Now, let's now look at uh, the model-based approach here. Okay, this is uh, something that we uh, you might be, might have been thinking, okay, we went all this hard work to do these class the classical analyses here. Okay, all right. How about logistic regression? You might be thinking. <laughs> well, okay. 
What are the explanatory variables with a direct approach using logistic regression? Well, what have we got? We've got the 621 indicators for the match sets, and then we've got the crucial regression coefficient here, which is which is beta 1, which is going to be the log odds ratio. Mm hmm. What do we got here? We got a lot of things to estimate. And it turns out, again, I, 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 there's, there's been a, quite a bit written about this going back a long, long time, that such an analysis turns out to be incorrect, in, insofar as it can be shown that the estimate one gets of the crucial regression coefficient here, beta 1, turns out to be biased. There's quite a bit written about this. Again, the math is, is very interesting. But the, it, the point is, logistic regression, from the, from the basic point of view here, uh, will not be successful. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, how about if I just drop all of these regression coefficients? Well, we know that the uh, analysis that the, and the design here very crucially depended on the match sets. So we've got to we've got to have them involved here. Okay. So we cannot oversimplify this and including all of these characteristics, and you might even be thinking more even more elaborate tones where we might have terms involving the product of delta and D. Let's not go there. <laughs> okay, because it turns out that the correct analysis uses the conditional likelihood I referred to just a few minutes ago and the conditioning approach based on the construction of the concordant and discordant sets and then conditioning on the number exposed gives us what turns out to be the definitive analysis here. We get a conditional likelihood in which the usual techniques of likelihood are available to us. Well, so guess, guess who was the first to be a long time ago to develop the early work on the conditioning approach? Well, there he is. There he is, Ari Fisher. He, again, it turns out, very much instrumental in building the uh, con argument for conditioning. Quite a bit here. It's quite something, actually. Now, the establishment of the methods didn't come for quite a while later. Conditional logistic regression uh, did, not, did not get uh, attention uh, from a theoretical or even a, uh, the ability to consider such analyses until, I guess it was the 1970s. In any case, conditional logistic regression uh, became available in the, in the mid-1970s. And the arguments were, uh, that enabled this to be done were established by Professor David Cox. Okay. There was another uh, researcher by the name of McFadden, an econometrician, who it turns out was deve developed in the mid-1970s essentially the same conditional log logistic approach. In a different context, um, McFadden is a name you might know from, from econo econometrics. Turns out he, uh, he was a Nobel laureate. And, uh, well... The point being here is that it's a very interesting circumstance in which, um, for for reasons that are, are not clear to me actually, as historian of of these methods, uh, that they both came up with the same approach around the same time. Well, enough. Enough of this history. 
So how do we carry out this analysis? Well, uh, in, in Stata, we can do so with the data in, and this is interesting, in long format. And it is fairly, it's quite straightforward here. We, it, the command is not logit now, it is C logit for conditional logistic regression. So the outcome is exposure. The explanatory variable is case control status. And in addition, C logit requires a, 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 an option called group, which records the pair characteristic here. Now, here's an, an interesting example in which the uh, data is set up correctly, we think. We're all set to go, and what we get is a diagnostic, a note. It could be a note, it could be a warning. It is a diagnostic that comes with the analysis. This is something that we must address and check. Because the note is that 600 groups, or over 1,200 of our observations are dropped. What are those 600 groups? Well, folks, those are the concordant pairs, precisely the, 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 the individuals for which we get no contribution to the assessment of the, in this case, the case control exposure relationship. Mm -hmm. So we, we see that the Conditional logistic regression, or C logit in Stata, correctly removes the concordant sets and analyzes the data based on only the discordant pairs. There were 21 discordant pairs, and hence only 42 of the observations are, are remaining. Of the 621 match sets, only 21 are used in the analysis. And 600 of the match sets cannot be used for this analysis. And then we get a, a, standard, anal a standard output. We get an estimate of the log odds ratio, a standard error, and so on. A p-value and a confidence interval. Now, it's worth noting here that conditional logistic regression is using the normal approximation to the binomial here. Okay. This is again taking us to the fact that at this particular time, exact methods for carrying out conditional logistic regression of more elaborate forms, as we will, we will be seeing, are, are available in the approximate form. Okay. So what we get is the, the estimate of the odds ratio and a p-value that is based on the normal approximation to the binomial. And similarly, the confidence interval based on the normal approximation to the binomial. Okay. Let's now have a look at the uh, study in which we had a case control study in which there were four controls per case. And I should, should mention that, uh, if I have not already done so, that so much of this is, is, is expanded in considerable detail in the marvelous book on the analysis of case control studies by Breslow and Day. Highly recommended. So here we're looking at a relationship between the case control status and exposure to estrogen use status for our analysis here. And here's what it looks like. Now we have exposure to estrogen, that is the outcome, case control status, uh, is the explanatory variable and the option of group recording uh, the indicator for each of the uh, match sets of five. 
Then we get a, a diagnostic again. And you can see here that there are five groups or 25 individuals that are dropped. That is precisely the five match sets of five. So the 25 observations or five match sets of five. So what we have is, is, is determined that our uh, uh, analysis has correctly dropped the concordant sets. That's important. Okay. All right. So now we can see we get an odds ratio estimate a p-value that's that's quite small and confidence limits. Now you may be thinking, okay, that this exact or correct uh, conditional logistic regression not so different from uh, the uh, earlier analysis we did ignoring the matching. Now what you don't know in any particular investigation is whether or not the correct analysis will be materially different from the incorrect analysis. So what we have in uh, our, the illustrations I've given you here is two circumstances. One where the, the correct matched analysis is quite different from the incorrect analysis. And here we have an example of which we've done a lot of heavy lifting and we've used the con correct conditional logistic regression. But the, uh, the end result is not that different from the uh, incorrect 2 by 2. Now, I mean, again, I would emphasize for you here that it is never easy to determine whether or not it will matter or not. And I, I certainly can always recommend, whenever you can, you need to use the exact or correct analysis that matches the study design. Okay. And as I promised earlier, here is a visual that shows you the actual conditional likelihood function and, and the approximation that is the basis for the construction of the standard errors and the confidence intervals. Okay, so there is this rather intimidating looking function which we can create in Stata and we can const construct uh, the approximating parabola here. So we can then graph these, these two curves. And here, just, just wanting to point out that the exact, which is the solid curve, is not that different from the dotted, which is the approximating curve. So this approximating curve is a parabola, and the actual lo conditional logistic function, lo uh, log logistic function, is just slightly asymmetrical. And maybe it's worth noting here that not that materially different when you're near the MLE. And that turns out to be important too. Okay. Now, I mentioned that matching is a design-based way of addressing potential confounders. So if, if a confounder can be determined in advance as a as a, a strong potential confounder and if matching is available to the investigator then one could con could consider constructing match sets where for every match set the the confounders or potential confounders are the same the values of the confounders are the same now it turns out that we can, in principle, still address confounding in a matched analysis. And as an example only, let's consider where we might wonder whether or not hypertension is a confounder. 
because hypertension was not one of the characteristics that was used when we uh, controlled, when we constructed the match sets. So then we would be interested in the odds ratio estimate adjusted for hypertension and comparing it with the odds ratio estimate without that adjustment. And what we can see here is that uh, the, the two odds ratio estimates are, are not materially different. So we get, in this instance, no indication that hypertension is a confounder. Now I mention this only as an example. One could say that if we are going to be careful with the approach and hypertension is an issue that we might want to address, then you may want, you may be thinking, okay, Gordon, we should have assessed whether or not hypertension is a modifier first. And that is certainly the case. But what I'm pointing out here is that characteristics that are the, have the potential to confound, but were not a part of the matching uh, process can still be addressed using the uh, conditional logistic regression approach. Okay. One more point with, with, this, with this data set, and that is uh, the issue of uh, a characteristic as a potential modifier, even though it was a part of the matching criteria. Now, the argument for matching is based on the issue that the investigators concerned about age as a confounder. It turns out that analyses based on uh, an assessment of age as a modifier is still available. And in fact, even though we matched on age, it is still possible that age modifies. We have only addressed the issue of age as a potential confounder. Now here is a, an instance, just as an example only here again, where we're, we'll suppose for this illustration that age was matched exactly. And so there's no, if, you, if I may, there's no residual uh, confounding here that actual age was used. Now, that turns out not to be quite true here, but nevertheless. So then we can consider a model that, it, that considers uh, case control status, hypertension, and the product of age and case control status. And what we see here is a p-value that's very high, so there's no evidence that age is a modifier here. Now, it is also worth noting here that age is not included in this conditional logistic regression command because age cannot uh, have any, any value. It, if, in fact, we did match exactly, then the regression coefficient we would get for age here would be zero. Now, I'm skipping a lot of the detail here. There's quite a bit in play. Suffice to point out then that an analysis of age as a potential modifier can be done with a model that does not include age in the model. Now you may recall that we've, we've discussed the whole notion of models being hierarchically well formulated. And here's a nice example of a circumstance, a circumstance in which this model is not at least by technical definition, hierarchically well formulated because age is included in the model even though the product of age and case control status is. Now it does turn out that there, there's complicating issues here because age wasn't exactly matched. They matched by age group. So uh, I, I, you may, you may want to have a look at this with the actual data that's available on my website. Now, that's, that is, that's a, an, a, an issue, but not present here. Okay, the point being here is that, that I, I don't want to get deflect too much from the 
the crucial issues here for you. But um, even though age was a part of the criteria used for matching, one can still consider whether or not age is a modifier. And as I mentioned, this particular model that it includes the product of age and case control status, but does not need to include the age characteristic. And I'll just emphasize again that for our for this particular uh, notion of matching, we have constructed a design-based way of addressing confounding. In other words, if in fact uh, we have correctly matched with regard to the characteristics that might in, might might have give a, g given us complicated confounding issues, ones perhaps needing quite elaborate assessments of confounding, right? Then, then those are not in play. However, it is again worth emphasizing here that even though we, we've used a match study, the ability to, to study modification is still available to you. Okay, so, so far we've had two examples of matching. We've had a match cohort study, one-to-one -one matching, and we've had a match case control study. I think it's fair to say that, at least with my current understanding of the legacy of matching, that matching is seen far more often with case control type studies than it is with uh, case control type studies. Nevertheless, here's one more example for you. Here the investigators were looking at the relationship between esophageal cancer and, cancer, and uh, alcohol consumption. And uh, this, this particular study conducted in Thailand. So it turned out that the investigators had access to data on, on 40 cases. These are individuals that did have esophageal cancer. And they were able to recruit or had available the data at hand for uh, 129 age and sex match controls. Now, first thing we can notice here is that, and one could see this by looking at the data directly, which is, which is also available on the website, that the matching was not the same for all of the cases. In fact, the case control ratio varied from one to one, that is one control per case, to actually six to one, where there were six controls per case. It turns out that the use of, of the classical methods or the uh, model-based method here, conditional logistic regression, is available even though the case control ratio varies depending on the case. Okay, so what we have is a uh, uh, the exposure to the rubber industry, okay. And they had potential confounders uh, that, were, that were of interest, and the data is available to you. Let's look at the various tables then that are in play in this, in this analysis, the start of the analysis, which would be called so we have then the six different types of, of case control ratio. We can see here that there were, it turned out, three matched pairs, right? Here we can see that in one of them, one of the three, the control was exposed. And in two of them, the control was exposed and the case was not. Uh, sorry, the wrong way around. I'm sorry, getting that the wrong way around. 
The case was exposed, but the control was not. That's one. And in two of them, we, we see that it was the, uh, uh, the case was not exposed and neither was the control. So we can see there were two concordant sets here and one discordant set or one discordant pair. Let's now look at, for example, uh, the fact that they had amongst the controls, they had uh, three uh, match triples. And what did they have? They had two triples where the uh, case was exposed and the, neither of the controls were. And they had uh, one match triple where uh, both of the controls were exposed, but the case was not. Okay, you can see that we have sets all the way up to the, the uh, uh, two by two table all the way to a two by seven table, and you can you can check to see how that all comes together. In any case, it turns out that in Stata it's no problem. You then have all of the different match sets of different size. And we could then consider a conditional logistic regression where the exposure was alcohol and, oh yeah, the, uh, yeah, the uh, exposure was alcohol and case control status was esophageal cancer. Okay, and then you see we get this, this uh, warning or note again. Six groups dropped. Well, you could go back and check that here, and it, it's highly recommended that you do that, that all is well. Your data is correctly configured. We got two match sets here where they're concordant. We got two here where there were th three controls per case, and there was one here where there were five controls per case, and there's one more. This one over here, where there was, where the uh, seven, or six, excuse me, six uh, controls per case, and uh, the case was exposed, and all six controls were. Okay, so that is the six groups, and you could also tally up the number of observations that are correctly dropped in this analysis. And we get then. A familiar looking analysis. Is there a relationship between alcohol exposure and case control status? And we did this analysis for a circumstance in which there was a variable number of controls per case. And I could also add that we could have match sets which which contain more than one case so that you can have variable numbers of cases and variable numbers of controls. All of these are possible and uh, enabling uh, quite flexible analyses for pretty complicated looking matching matching studies. In any case, that then gives us our third example of a matched analysis.